Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. So our goal today is to discuss Franklin Roosevelt's legacy and the legacy of the New Deal. Can somebody remind us of the questions that I asked in relation to our discussion about Franklin Roosevelt? First question was, was the New Deal successful? Second was, should FDR be remembered as one of our greatest presidents or one of the most dangerous ones? Okay, let's stop there for one second. So one of the key questions that we need to answer today is, should FDR be remembered as one of our greatest presidents or one of our most dangerous. I would encourage you, as you think about that question, to put it in the context of other things we've discussed in class this year. In particular, what Lincoln promised America uh, in the Gettysburg Address and in his second inaugural address, that America was going to be about the things we promised we were going to be about, right? This new birth of freedom, the idea of government of uh, by and for the people. And so let's try to remember to put FDR's presidency in the context of what Lincoln promised after or during the Civil War that America would become, because I think that is important to us uh, answering the question. Um, Hannah, can you remind us of the third question? Um, what does it mean to say FDR smile was the most important New Deal program? And Lewis, what about the final question? Uh, which New Deal program do you think was the most impactful? Right, so I would encourage you to think about the video that you watched for this class and for the reading that you did uh, to sort of provide factual evidence before you make your argument. So we'll just open it up for discussion and see where we get. All right, we can start with the first question. Was the New Deal successful? I believe that it was successful because it did put us back on track for where we are today. A lot of the programs that FDR set are seen today in some form or another. So it does have like long held repercussions that are good for the country. Yeah. I would mostly agree with you. Um, though I think it's worth noting that World War One in particular kind of provided that extra boost we needed to get all the way towards economic recovery. Yeah, I actually disagree. So for the first couple of years, FDR's like ideas, like they did work because like he started at like the unemployment rate started at 24.9% of like unemployment and, it, and when his ideas were implemented in 1937 it went down all the way to 14.3 but once he stopped like his ideas kind of like let back a little bit it went right back up to 19% which could show that like they helped but they only helped for like a certain amount of time. Yeah his ideas were more like an emergency time um, well well, I think his ideas certainly worked, but the re the, probably the reason why the employment rate went back up is because um, his ideas got declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, so they weren't able to be implemented anymore. So it could have been why the unemployment rate went back up there in this presidency. Yeah, so the Supreme Court overturned the AAA and the NRA, so the AAA was the Agriculture Act, so when like they paid farmers not to plant, and then the NRA was when he told businesses the prices and like the labor that they could use, which the Supreme Court deemed unconstitutional because you can't just um, tell a farmer that they cannot grow crabs or you can't tell a business uh, how they, what they do. I think that the reason why this plan was successful because like it kind of embodied like common good versus individual liberty. Like you had people on his board that were quite conservative and then um, you had more liberals. So I think the reason why it was so effective was because it kind of supported like not only the Democratic Party, but also the Republican Party. And I think in the video it mentioned how he was like a master of like the political arts, which is really important to his campaign. Yeah, I think as one of his quotes said, he didn't really care where the ideas were coming from. He would try something, he saw a goal, and if something he tried didn't work to fix it, he would try something else, regardless of whether it was liberal or conservative. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't really care about the ideology behind the ideas. It was more about what works and what didn't, which is one of the reasons I think he was one of the greatest presidents, because he wasn't concerned as much as Democratic or Republican. It was just what needed to happen. Yeah, he knew the artistry of politics and how to like, um, 
maneuver it to get things passed so that the American people could get help. Let's uh, let's focus a little bit on Annabelle's idea of this question of common good versus individual liberty. So. Do, does everyone agree that Roosevelt's policies were a balance between the two, or do we see more of one or more of the other? It is, do we agree with Annabelle that there's sort of a mix of conservative and liberal policies in FDR's programs, or does anybody see it differently? I kind of think that um, his programs are very progressive and very socialist, and I think you can't really say that he's working for the individual liberty. He's really only working for the common good in this case, and also, He's really stretching the Constitution, um, which is directly against individual liberty. So I think it's more of a common good argument in this case. Yeah, the NRA and the AAA were two of the biggest examples of common good because normally governments can't set like prices for things or tell <coughs> farmers what to do. So that was highly on the common good side because it helped the people, but maybe not the individuals. Um, I mostly agree with you. However, I think if we take a look at the larger picture, um, the view could kind of change a bit because the policies he instituted were not meant to last forever. They were kind of emergency acts. So in the short term, 100%, they benefited the common good. However, in the long term, their idea was to go back towards the classic America, which is mostly in there for individual liberty. I would disagree because I think he kind of redefined what it means to be president. Like before this time, the role of the president and the role of the government was kind of just to protect the people, um, just to be there and protect their individual liberty and rights. But once people like TR and people like FDR come around, they start to talk about social programs and ways where the government is not only protecting people, but it's helping people and supporting people. So I think FDR is the first time where presidency and government kind of becomes this program for the people instead of just protecting the people. I agree. Like, each president, they bring, like, a new kind of title to the job and, like, what they do. Like, each president needs to help do the last to be remembered. So I think that since Lincoln, like, even Washington, they all did different things, but each of them have, like, pivotal moments that, like, make them the president of that era. And I think that FDR, by, like, deploying all these like socialist policies kind of like stretched out what like the president can do again and then kind of like made it so future presidents can also stretch the glove or like whatever interpretation you want as like the president's job can you really take example from someone who is a president in like an emergency like this <clears throat> well, well yeah because they're there was a president during World War One. There was a president during World War Two. There's <coughs> multiple presidents that had to go through calamity. Like, you can take an example from Lincoln. The country was literally separated into two sides. So, was he not in a like detrimental like state that like he had to keep the country together? Do you think FDR would have been such a great president, known as one of the best, if it wasn't for the Great Depression? No, I don't think he would be one of the best if the Great Depression wasn't there. Because a lot of his policies wouldn't have mattered if the country wasn't already so low in like economics. Right. I think though that doesn't take away from the fact that like I guess his pers persona is kind of what made the people enjoy him the most. As the, the reason why people regard him as like one of the best presidents isn't mainly because of like the like the different committees he made or like the different acts he made, but rather like the persona that he carried, the fact that he went inside people's homes to like communicate with them. And I feel like even if it wasn't the Great Depression, he would still be doing the same thing because overall he's like a very optimistic person, which kind of allowed people to like put their trust onto him and support whatever decision that he decides to make for the country. Yeah, um, I think Jesse also tied into the, the question of why how like his smile was so important because it showed his like optimism and he was like, everything's going to be okay, and that's what people needed at the time. And it also, I think we mentioned that his like campaign song was like, Happy Days Are Here Again. And so that really his smile and his personality were an important part of his campaign and his like, presidency overall. I'm curious, about the, I'm curious about the value judgment that's being made about FDR. Because what I hear, I hear somewhat coming through in the comment is maybe from Austin and Desi, it seems like you are saying he's a great president. Like you are arguing that, that, that there is greatness there, but I'm not sure with what Josh's argument is. Like I, I feel like 
Josh, I think what you're saying is, um, you know, this idea that he he stretched the glove or he made the powers of the presidency greater or he went beyond, he really focused on the common good to the detriment of what the Constitution says the president's supposed to do. But I'm not sure I hear a value judgment there. Are you arguing or what would other people argue that that we have to take that into consideration and maybe mitigating the greatness of FDR? Like what's what's your argument or what, what are other people's thoughts about that piece of it? Because I'm not sure I hear sort of a critical value judgment being made there. I think you're describing what he did, which I think is important, but I, what I think we want to get at here is, was he great or not? And I think what some of you are saying is that it's the times that made him great, and some of you are saying, no, he was great regardless of the times, and some of you are saying maybe he wasn't so great because he took things too far. I think we need to get a little deeper at that. Which of those three categories, or are there other categories that you think it falls into? was that he like got too much power like there was too much power on the president's role like I don't think like president should have that much power like he basically single-handedly like made all these like committees so I think I think an issue with that is he put too much power in one position well yeah. he didn't really have that power he kind of just broke the constitution over and over again so yeah. I agree with Annabelle because he served, FDR served four terms, which wasn't illegal at the time, but it still gives him more of a power because he could influence America for longer. So I do believe he had that. I think that was his intention the whole time. I mean, he said in his inaugural address, he literally told the people that he was going to break the Constitution. Like, he told the people he was going to do that. I think that was his plan the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I agree. He, he, that, that ties into how he said, like, the, the thing to fear of fear itself. It talks about how he's going to, like, break the Constitution. He's going to be, like, not capitalist and, like, other people, but, like, not to be afraid. So that's... I think it was also about people were fearing that, the got, like, the country wasn't going to go back yeah. after all these, like, social, like, extreme socialist um, policies he was putting in. People were fearing that the country was going to stay like that or maybe even become communist. So I think what he was saying there was saying, don't worry, like this is only temporary. It's gonna, we're gonna, country is gonna go back to normal. So in your estimate, then, what's your value judgment there? Like, what you're saying, I think, is accurate. That he tells everyone he's gonna break the constitution on day one, and then he, and then he does it. Like as Austin points out repeatedly. So, is it okay that we have a president that breaks the constitution? Um, I don't think so. I think he did get the job done and he did fix America's economy, but going back to like the glove reference, the glove was stretched, but it was never it never completely went back. We still have um, like you can still see the effects today of how he pushed the uh, his own powers and the government's powers. I completely agree. Um, I think that Roosevelt definitely used his powers for great things. He saw his goals as ensure the life, liberty, and happiness of every person in America, and he did everything with or without his power to make sure that happened, but he also kind of left the door open for presidents that follow him to do not so great things with that power. But I'm confused though, because I feel like you're saying it's not a good thing, and you're saying it is a good thing except for the precedent that it sets. Like, don't we have to also take into consideration, like, what if he hadn't done it? Like, what if he hadn't done what he did in the crisis moment? Um, would the country have survived? Because what was his point? What was Roosevelt's argument about why he had to do this? Yeah, I mean, the idea was, I might have to break the Constitution to save the Constitution, right? So I think a, a deeper question we have to think about is, can you save the Constitution by breaking it? Can you save capitalism by putting more socialism into it? Because right? that's essentially what he does. And that was, the, and I think I think Grant's right. That was his, he said he was going to do it. He told everyone he was going to do it, and then he and then he does it. So I think we also have to take into consideration, like, does his greatness come from the fact that he does this even though he shouldn't have done it? Does his greatness come from the legacy? that is set or opened by that? Or is that is that the thing that makes him so dangerous historically? I don't believe he himself was dangerous, but maybe the question that he set was dangerous. I sort of, I agree with James. 
like the programs that he put in place were extremely helpful and for like the time of emergency. But again, it opens up a door for later presidents to do similar things to break the Constitution, which possibly could destroy it. But in this situation, it helped it. So it's just about the precedent being set. Yeah, I agree with what Hannah said. I feel like if a different president was in an FDR situation and, and were given the same powers that FDR used, maybe the country would have gone into a different direction. And maybe like it would have become more of a dictatorship. I feel like FDR was like, the perfect person to have this much power in America. He, he, he handled it well. Yeah. He was the perfect. Yeah. I mean, I think also something else to consider is the fact that like if he didn't do like, such a thing, if he didn't create all these programs and stretch the Constitution, then our country would have probably been in like the situation that like who we elected in of like how capitalism was kind of collapsing on itself and it wouldn't have really like progressed. So I feel like things that he did, um, I think, although may have been extreme, I think it was like necessary at the time as like kind of, as people have said before, like kind of an urgent um, like solvency. Of the yeah, problem. FDR said he was either going to be the best president <coughs> in history or the last. So I think that ties directly to what you were saying. Yeah, I feel like in order for uh, FDR said to save the country, I would do. I would stretch the constitution to save the country if necessary. And um, if that permanently stretches the glove, it's worth it because if he didn't, then the country might not even exist. So, Lewis, are you saying that? So, just a question: You said are you saying like desperate times call for desperate measures? Is that someone's the argument you're making? Yeah. I agree. It's kind of even more necessary that sometimes FDR had to break the rules. Because the Constitution couldn't exactly have a clause in it that says you can ignore it if you think the times are trying enough. Because that would allow any president to come along and say, okay, we're going to do this now. But by breaking the rules, you always have the option that the Supreme Court can come along and strike down whatever acts you're saying. So I think FDR kind of used the perfect balance in the situation. Well, that's not true because eventually FDR eventually like packed the courts. He appointed eight Supreme Court justices to stop the Supreme Court from stopping his power. But the eight wasn't due to the like act that he passed. It was just because they they died or retired. So well, he also asked if anyone over the age of seventy in the Supreme Court would retire, which before was not a thing. Mm -hmm. So what do we think is more impactful, what he did or the precedence he set? The precedence he set, because as we've talked about, he like stretched the glove, and so his precedence of like breaking the Constitution when it's needed was more impactful. I disagree. I think what he did was more important, because now that you can't, like, I, don't, I couldn't imagine in America without Social Security. Like, a lot of your grandparents who live here wouldn't be able to, maybe with your parents' income, you could probably survive, but like the average American's like, grandparents couldn't survive now without Social Security. And minimum wage, he also like created that. And the way America is today, I feel like it's more, it was more influenced by the New Deal policies and the precedents he set by the kind of stretch of the Constitution. I agree with you on this, especially about the relief agencies. My family has gotten like money from FEMA because last year at the beginning of the year my house flooded and we wouldn't be able to I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't got that like extra money to help pay to like get someone to live. So I think some of the programs that he set was necessary and helped us to this day. Let's take a pause for a second and see how we feel we've done kind of getting at the deeper questions. Um, do we feel like we've we've kind of answered the question about FDR's greatness or do we keep do we keep contradicting ourselves? So why why is that? Like what's what do we need to do in order not to dodge the question? Yes or no. Answer it straight up. How how do we do that though? I mean it's not like we all have to agree on this, but I do agree that it seems somewhat contradictory because I'll hear people saying yeah, he was great, um, but the legacy is more important than, um, than what he did. And then someone else will say, no, what he did is more important than the legacy. And some of you are saying that the legacy is bad, that the legacy is dangerous, 
but you're still saying FDR was great. So it's, it's a little bit confusing to me about what it is some of you are arguing. Um, and so I think if, if we're going to get at the deeper question, we got to sort of, you got to decide like what you think. You know, it, like the whole question here is like how are we measuring greatness? How are we measuring Roosevelt's contributions to American history? And how does that fit into the larger picture of American history? Like why is what he did so important to American history? And if, you're, if you think that that legacy is more dangerous than it was good, then you've got your answer, right? If you think that the, that the, what he did in sort of interpreting the Constitution the way he did and the way he opened the door to like future presidents, or maybe you think that that change in the way we view government that comes from FDR is the best thing about him, right? It seems like you've got to kind of figure out for yourself where you fit in that argument and, and then sort of make that argument. I think that's, that's what we have to get at, right? I think his legacy both had good aspects and bad aspects. He, as Austin said, he kind of stretched the glove. He opened the door for other presidents to use power for not so good things. But he also left a number of programs in place that, as Hannah said, do help to this day. So that kind of neutralizes his legacy. It's kind of hard to say it's definitely good or it's definitely bad. Whereas I think what he did in the time, it mostly worked. Yes, you can argue that there were certain parts that didn't accomplish what he wanted, but he tried something and he tried other things. And I'd say that's good. I think, I think, I think though, like we keep going back to like the stretch and the glove like kind of analogy, but the thing is that he wasn't the first president to do so. Like it's not like he was the first president to go over the Constitution. Like for example, Andrew Jackson did things out of his presidency and he violated the Constitution. But, but so like I think stretching the glove is something that like a lot of presidents have done before. So I think what we should be focusing on is like the things that he's established and how he's like helped the country through a time of crisis, not necessarily focusing on how he stressed the glove because it's been something that's already done before. And if we, and if we like keep focusing on like the stretching the glove thing that we keep going back to, then we're not gonna get anywhere because it's not like he did something new. It's already been done before. So that's kind of what I think. But yeah, I think, I think he's it. doing it for a reason though. Yeah. yeah there's obviously an emergency at hand. And I think what he did was probably the best like, option what he had. Um, and I think, I think the reason why, I mean, he won the two terms that he, or he, he ran for more, but the, the two terms that were great landslides, the first one, Hoover, he, he, Hoover only won six states. And I think it's because he knew what he was going to do, and Hoover wasn't going to make a move about it. And I think even if Roosevelt's views and what he did may have been unconstitutional, I think it was what, was best for America. Um, so Hannah, Hannah mentions the idea of like uh, agencies that still exist, right? Like she talked about FEMA, which at the time was the Federal Emergency Relief Agency. Now it's the Federal Emergency Management Agency, but the same idea. What, but I think Max brings up a good point, like what are the things that he did? Like what are some of the facts that we should throw into this in terms of what were some of these agencies that were so impactful that maybe went beyond his constitutional authority, but were done in an emergency. Um, I think uh, the union one that he made was really important, and especially it was the CCC, right, where they built, like, I think in the video it said like, 20, it could pave back and forth like 20 times the amount of roads they made, and all the national, a lot of the national parks in America were made and maintained by the CCC. And also, it took a lot of families out of poverty because of the money that we sent back. And it gave, like, I forgot the exact amount, but it was, like, a huge amount of jobs. A lot of jobs were created just by that one little uh, like group he made. I think what he did with the National, <clears throat> the National Recovery Act was so important because he essentially gave an incentive to reduce um, prices and control wages and pay their employers higher because they were he was technically endorsing all these businesses for free just so they could lower their, uh, their prices and help bring up the economy back up again. I think that the CCC was the most important and it was also his favorite program because he, it was like a two in one, he increased the production of roads like Johanna said and he also gave employment to like 250,000 people and it was young people too so it started their lives and 
I think that really started to bring the country up. I think one of the most important points in the CCC is sending money back to their families so that they can live and buy things and spend this money and get it circulating back into the economy. And I think that's on top of other people just getting work and wages. I think sending it back to their families and getting that money circulating again is probably the most important part of that. And they were also like counted for it too. Like they, the workers, they had a place to live, they had food, and they also got money for their families. And like Graham said, it would start the economy back. Yeah, stimulated uh, like many people. It like the people who worked were able to. Um, they had shelter, um, shelter. Um, food and they were able to like pay for themselves. I think the money that they sent back to their families was also able to go back into the economy and stimulate that as well. So it really had many um, good effects for them. Yeah, so not only was it like helping people with like money and like um like their lives, it also helped like the infrastructure and like the um, land because of these that they were um, working in the national parks. So that's like did the critics of Roosevelt have a point in terms of the way he was using socialism? Did he take socialism too far? I don't think they were arguing that he took it too far. I think they were arguing the fact that it was socialism. Because I think a lot of these people wanted strictly capitalism in, in the market. Yeah. And this, uh, this uh, thought of him implementing a little bit of socialism, they thought that would turn into more communism. Because what was happening in Russia? Yeah, so the American Liberty Wings, they didn't like the New Deal because they thought that it made FDR more socialist and then like, and then the capitalists didn't like FDR because of that and they were afraid, which is what they were trying to like, the communists in Russia, which is what I was Yeah, I agree, like, um, I don't know if it's just because we like, a lot of us live in like a more modern age, but I'm looking at these policies and they don't seem that crazy to me and I was like, I was, um, when I was, I didn't really understand what the Liberty League, I didn't think they had like a point at all, like these policies were barely socialistic at all except for like social security. Is it possible that the reason they don't seem so crazy to us is because it's normalized yes. now? Yes. Right? I mean look what, look what it says on page 12 of the reading. Um, I think this relates directly to what Johannes just said. So this is, he's running for re-election in 1936, right? And he actually wins in 1936 with a bigger landslide than he won in 1932, if that was even possible, right? So we, in, when he runs for re-election, he actually wins more votes than he won when he ran against Hoover the first time. So that's a pretty big endorsement of the things he was doing in the first New Deal. But Roosevelt himself even had a reason for that. So it says in 1936, Roosevelt won in a bigger landslide than he had in 1932. In his second inaugural address, Roosevelt declared that the American people had changed their philosophy in the previous four years. They had come to appreciate, he said, that we, quote, all go up or else we all go down as one people, and that the federal government had become, quote, the instrument of our united purpose. Like, how did they see government before Roosevelt, and how did they see government after Roosevelt? With all these bills he passed, it helps people more, and like, it gives money to people, and it, it makes sure that they're not just like, like, they're not just 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 like, they not necessarily that it might just swoop in and help us in an emergency, but that government is supposed to be there to help us. When before, government's job was just to kind of organize things, make sure the mail got delivered, defend us if there was an attack on the country, like organize the military and things like that, right? And now all of a sudden, like we saw Theodore Roosevelt take little baby steps toward this, but now FDR has kind of jumped into the pool, right? And when he jumps in, it's it really becomes it becomes normalized. Look at the last sentence in the article: "A new America had been born because of what Roosevelt did." And so, I think it's important to think about that in the context of this time. But I also think it's important that we haven't really talked enough about the court packing plan, or maybe some of the other negative things about Franklin Roosevelt. What do we think about the fact that he ran four times before no one, no other president had ever done that before? Even though, like, politically, I feel like he was in the wrong for trying to 
like mess with the courts. I feel like the Supreme Court system is inherently anti-democratic because the justices serve for life. So a lot of the times they'll be really old and their views will be different from what the um, the act like what American people actually want. So although I feel like it was kind of totalitarian of him to try to push the judges out, you I think morally he was in the right, but it's kind of like a dangerous it's dangerous what he was doing, but I think like it's just it's like complicated. Isn't it good though to have justices that represent more classical viewpoints? I I that's I disagree. I feel like what the people want is more important than what like what more people want is more important than what like few people want. But what the people wanted in that case was to have a capitalist society and we pushed that so far it collapsed in on itself and caused the entire Great Depression. But, yeah. But at that point, um, the people were for um, FDR's new policies that's why he was elected. Well, no, they weren't. He did not mention any of his policies before he was elected the first time. No, he even right. said in his inaugural address that he's going to do something wrong and don't be scared because of it. Because it, as he was saying, don't fear like socialism, fear fear itself, he was basically saying, I'm going to do something that you're all scared of. That was what he was saying. But I think what Lucia was mentioning was about second. his second election, yeah, exactly. about he won in a huge landslide. And if he did something bad that the people didn't like, then he wouldn't have won the majority of the, like, the votes. Yeah, they didn't need to like, he won more. Yeah. Yeah. He won even more, which means that he had to be doing something right that the people liked, that like the electoral, the people who decide the electoral votes liked in order to be re-elected like, again. So I think that was what... Yeah, exactly. Was, like, they re-elected him again. But sh should he have run for a third term? Should he have run for a fourth term? I mean, remember, there was, Anna pointed this out earlier, there was nothing illegal about that then. Totally. They changed the Constitution after that. So it's not like presidents before him were restricted from running for a third or fourth or fifth term. There was nothing in the Constitution that restricted that. So it was just a tradition set by George Washington, right? And all the other presidents had followed that tradition. So what do we think about Roosevelt? I mean, in the many ways that he stretches the glove, I mean, as you've described, the way in which he saw the presidency or shaped the presidency. Yeah. So what do we think about that, breaking that precedent? I still think he shouldn't have run for president for a third time because like directly after his four terms is when they changed uh, the constitution to put a limit so obviously, the people saw a problem with people serving more than a, like a limited amount of terms. I think he was over-focused on like, the present time and didn't look at the future of the past. He wasn't as focused on what would come after him, but just as much as he could do during his time. But I also think that like, a long term means that people have like a dependency on you. Like, People that were young like, had the same president until like, when they were old. Like, they trusted this president. And like even if I feel like if they if the president did something wrong, the people would just have like this trust. They're like, oh, it's Roosevelt. Like he knows what he's doing. So I think it just causes a dangerous precedent. Like you give someone too much power. People who were like in their early childhood when he was elected, FDR was the only president they ever knew. So they wouldn't even have the context to understand that other presidents can be good too. It's also important to mention that when he runs for his third, uh, third term, uh, World War II has started. So I think lots of the people, they were so, like you said, so familiar with FDR that they didn't want a new president taking over during this uh, time of crisis, this uh, big World War. World War. So uh, I think people wanted him to still be in charge and see where he would move. I think that also shows like the trust that the people had in FDR. As like he wasn't afraid to like take risks and like do things wrong. I think that's what made him like such a like, good president, and that's why the people really trusted him and wanted him for the war. Well, I don't yeah. think he wasn't afraid. I think he just had to take those risks. I mean, like when he ran, uh, he knew what was coming. I don't really think it had anything to do with him being afraid at all. I mean, I think that he had to do all these things to pretty much save America, and it was kind of on his back. I'm saying he wasn't afraid. Yeah. I also think it kind of goes back to James' idea that like it's the only president they really know. So like, who else are you going to trust if you had this president for the last eight to ten years, and you literally just grown up and you're about to vote? You you just turned like 21 or 22 when he was going up for re-election, and he's the only president you know. 
like, like to add on to that, on page four, it says, um, if you burn down the Capitol, we would all cheer and say, um, well, at least, um, at least the fire started. And, like, people trusted him. Even if you hurt, if you, even if you hurt the people, people would cheer for him. That's just like how much trust they had in him. I think that's a really, really dangerous idea that people liked him so much that he could have, and you could argue he did, like abuse the trust he had in the people. Um, I mean, clearly he did something right because we came out on top in World War II, but I think it's a really dangerous idea about like how much trust the people really had in him. That he was like that quote that he could literally burn a building down and they would say, oh well, it's okay. But I think that's a really dangerous idea. I think you bring up a good point, Grant, that when he reruns for his fourth time, um, he dies a month later. So he wasn't necessarily in like top condition. So uh, would, it ha would it have been better for him to step down and say, uh, look, like to the American people that I'm done. I think it's time for a new president. Uh, I'm not. I don't think I'm fit uh, anymore, and should anyone else take over? It brings up a very, he wasn't very honest with the American people, he didn't like tell or anyone, and so like, no one, literally nobody, nobody knew that he was dying during, in, when he was in the fourth term. Harry Truman didn't even know who was a successor, he didn't know that there was like an atomic bomb that was like being made, so that's very interesting. Well, I feel like yeah, he couldn't have told anyone who was dying, because they were in the war. Like, I feel like that shows weakness. And maybe like the Axis powers would have done something if he had revealed to the public he was about to die. So maybe, I feel like it probably would have been best if he didn't run, but I feel like he probably thought he didn't have a choice, like I have to do this for this. I wasn't saying that he needs to tell you that he died, he's just saying like, I'm not gonna have to run. So I think we need to wrap things up, and I think we've done a good job of dissecting some of the pros and cons of the Roosevelt presidency and his legacy. Obviously, the decision of whether it's more positive or more negative is something that you each have to decide you know, for yourselves in terms of what you think about the facts and what you think about the, your understanding of this, of this time period. But I would just point out, I think, two things that are objectively just true. Like One is that for good or bad, Roosevelt changes the way we see government. Right? There's no doubt about that. Like You can argue that it's good that he did that. You can argue that it's bad that he did that. But everybody understands how that happened, right? Like everybody understands that we, we now see government as being the, the entity that's going to save us, protect us, support us, provide the safety net for us, right? And that uh, is because of, of Roosevelt. I also think it's objectively true that if you look at world history during this time, other countries got Hitler, Franco, Lenin, Stalin, right? Other countries got dictators, people who took complete power. And you could argue Roosevelt maybe could have done that, could have had that opportunity. And maybe some people argue that he did do that, that he went too far, that he made similar kinds of moves. But I do think as Americans, we probably, the, those of us in the room, that, that our Americans should probably think about the fact that we're lucky that we got FDR and not one of those other people that I mentioned, right? So I, I do think, and whether it's because of the structures that were in place to prevent Roosevelt from doing more, or whether it was Roosevelt himself, those are all things that I think you have to decide individually. Next week, we're gonna be able to take a little bit of a look at World War II and FDR's role in World War II, because we really were talking mostly about the New Deal and before that today, but I think we'll have a chance to see a little bit more about what's gonna happen next. So good job in the discussion.